Hello, I'm Lauren Curry, and this is the Service Design Show. In the Service Design Show, we talk to people that are shaping the service design field about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments, and challenges up ahead. In this episode, I'm talking to Lauren Curry. Lauren is the co-founder of Snook, the very first service design agency in Scotland, and she has been named in the list of 30 most influential women under 30 in Elle magazine. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Hello, thank you. It's good hey. to be here. Great to have you, Lauren. It's been quite a while since we actually spoke and met, and it was yeah. in Amsterdam. Yeah, I'm very jealous of all the cyclists going past. I love mm -hmm. Amsterdam. So uh, where are you now? Are you still in Scotland? I'm in London right oh. now. I'm, I moved to London in January. Um, mm. So, yeah, southeast London. Exciting. Lauren, um, do you recall your very first memory of service design? Yes. Um, so I first discovered service design when I was at art school. Uh, I was studying a product design degree. And the man that had designed my program and was the director of my course brought all the students together when I was in first year to tell us that he was leaving and he was starting a new job. All right. And his new job was to run the live work oh. office in Newcastle. So then I asked lots of questions about who live work where and what service design was. And from that moment on, I was extremely excited and drawn to this process. And I then had a lecture from Professor Mike Press that was all about design against crime. Mm. And he was talking about, um, you know, designers working with the Home Office to create interventions and design products and services to prevent crime. And that, you know, again, just lit a huge passion in me for how you can use how we can use this process to do good. Mm. Um, and I was probably, I was 18, 19 years old then. Mm. Wow. Um, and service design hasn't let go since then. Yeah, we've been friends, best friends ever since. Mm. <laughs> um, Lauren, as we believe in co-creation in, uh, in service design, we're also going to apply it to, uh, to the show today. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's explain how it, uh, how it works, right? I have a few cards here with a topic written uh, on them. And you also have a few, in this case, posters, right? Mm -hmm. Can you show me one? Sure thing. What if? So you have a few question starters written on your posters. I have a, a topic. I'll show up a topic and you'll show up a question starter. And then it's uh, your task to uh, answer the question that you all created okay right um so let's just jump right in uh, into uh, into the topics lauren and i'll uh, pick uh, one and i think this one is uh, close to your heart at least um let's start with the topic of design education mm -hmm. can you pick a question starter that goes along with that mm. what do you make out of that what if? I'm not sure. So I can't. Um, what if design education transformed the how designers work and the role of designers in society, or transformed the skill set of a designer, or? Well, I, I would say uh, you pick one because you have to answer it. So. Uh... Um, so I think my the things I'm thinking about around design education right now are design is clearly at a stage where it's the you know it's it has the most influence it's ever had in history before. It's finally been taken serious by the business world, by the tech world, by governments all over the world. And my big question is, what does that mean for design education? All right. Um, how might we design designers who are fit for purpose, but also who are going to challenge the status quo and who are going to push boundaries and shape new roles and spaces and contexts for designers to really thrive and have impact. Mm -hmm. So I've 
really curious around how traditional universities are tackling that and also alternative schools like Hyper Island and Chaos Pilots General Assembly. Um, I spent the last year at Hyper Island designing their first ever master's program in service design mm. and one of the things that I really took away from that was the increasing demand for meaningful work and the number of students both you know young mature older students of a wide range of backgrounds are really looking for social they have a very strong social conscience right. yeah um and i think that design education has to yeah it's the biggest challenge we face as designers it's a design problem because there is a lot of unemployed graduates out there there's also a lot of designers who are making useless stuff mm. that nobody needs mm. um, and I'm really excited about how we can tackle that so what do you think is the biggest transformation that needs to happen within design education I think industry and education need to work together as one I think right now there's a bit of a us and them culture where one blames the other mm. Um, I get really frustrated when industry blame education and point. What do you mean with the industry? The, the agencies, the agencies, practitioners, businesses, mm. and by education I mean universities and schools and colleges, and they have to work together as one. Mm -hmm. um, which for us and for for us who are practitioners, that is about. Um, giving up time to be a mentor, it's about sharing our process and our learnings online, it's about making ourselves findable to the people who are out there who are inspired by us and want to know what our journey's been and, and how we how we got there. So, um, I've been, having designed a course in uh, around design education at Hyper Island, what were the reactions of students so the student, um, there's been a huge increase in student numbers. Mm. There's lots of students really wanted to come in and study the program. And um, a lot of the feedback we got was around the, the fact that the model is very based on experiential learning. So yeah. all, of the, all of the projects are real. There is a live client brief. Um, and it's designed in a way that they get as much exposure to industry practitioners as possible. Um, a reflection of mine is that there's definitely a tension with that and, and gaining an academic qualification where yeah. you have to tick boxes. And so how do you create a learning environment where um, you know, prototyping and learning by doing and making mistakes is really celebrated, but yet you, you know, you want to achieve an A, and mm -hmm. both those mm -hmm. things attract different types of people. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really. Um, I think it's a big challenge for education, and uh, I'm really curious if traditional education will find an answer to that. And I think, I think again, it's about. Um, all of us working together, which I think is, is very easy to say, but very difficult in practice because yeah. universities are having to rethink their business model, they're having to rethink their funding streams, and this is causing conflict and tension and competition and things that make collaboration very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is right mm -hmm. now, but mm -hmm. I think we need to find one. Exciting times for that. For people who are in the educational field and trying to well, cope with, with this. Yeah, and I say that often to the students that I work with. It feels like, you know, the most exciting time to, to study design and to be a design student um, because the the perception of design is changing really rapidly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's... Well, they have the opportunity to shape, to shape design education as they go along, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Lauren, uh, are you ready to move on to a second topic? Sure, yep. Okay, um, let's touch upon uh, this one, and this is around product consumption and maybe the promise of service design leading to mm -hmm. less product consumption. Do we have a question started that goes along with this one? Um, how much? 
So what would be your question? Um, so I think I would ask the question like how much how much has service design really changed at scale how society consumes stuff. And what is your answer to that? Um, so I think it's when we when we come back right to the basics of what service design is and what its purpose is and, and why why it kind of naturally came to be out of other disciplines that it kind of evolved from. One of those core things was about to reduce consumption and to move us away from a product orientated society to a service orientated society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things like Zipcar and car sharing schemes and um, tool swap workshops, um, Airbnbs, Ubers, yeah, yeah. the things that reduce the products that we buy and we consume and change our behavior around our relationship with, with physical goods. Yeah. And I think the reality is, you know, that that's not happened that much. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's something that we should, you know, our community should be questioning and critiquing mm -hmm. and figuring out, is that something that, that, that we still aspire to? Is that something that we want to work on? Is it something we are working on? And what does, you know, what does good look like? What will the next five years be? Because I really want um, the brilliant people I know who work in this space, these are the types of people who I want to be designing the next Facebook and designing the, you know, the infrastructure that's going to really fundamentally make a difference to things like climate change. Um, and I'm sure that I know that that is happening in, in small pockets, mm. but I would love to have a conversation about how we do that at a much, uh, at a much wider scale. So um, would it have to do with the fact that search design as a field and as a practice is still very much evolving and people are trying to find, figure out their spot within the field? I mean, yes, and but also no, because I think that will be an excuse forever. And I right. think that's uh, something that all disciplines face at some point or other. And it's something that, um, yeah, it's not it's not really the right question to mm -hmm. ask or the right thing to focus on. I think what we should be focusing on is um, is the how. Like how do we how do we do this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My my question would be what what would be needed to actually accelerate this process towards less product consumption and more service designers actually designing for less product consumption. What what would be needed to accelerate it? Mm. So I think one one immediate thought is um, service designers working more closely with um, engineers and industrial designers and people who make very tangible physical things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I again, I think that does happen. And how we make that happen more again, design education is one by uh, engaging with engineering programs, computer science programs, um, and really building up those relationships so that when the you know that that becomes a part of the design education journey and something that students get exposed to very early on to understand, you know the what the role of a physical product in the world is today mm -hmm. and how that's changing. Because uh, I think obviously digital is in a massive context that has to be explored and taken into account as well. So I think closer collaborations. Um, and, you know, one way we're going to start to be taken seriously by those guys is by getting much better at proving our value and mm -hmm. measuring our impact mm -hmm. and having uh, strong quantitative data around where our process adds value and we'll, what we'll get to the, that topic in a in a in a minute uh lauren i i think it's also interesting if we have really strong more really strong case studies from the maker industry what happens if you collaborate with a service designer because i think if you look at business models uh the opportunity is there the opportunity is huge for for the maker industry to actually 
invest in uh, in services. Yeah, for sure. And there's lots of you know in the in London, there's a Maker Versity in Scotland. We've mm. got MacLab. Um, these these guys are. You know they are all designers. They they embrace the principles associated with this process of you know being very uh, having a strong bias towards action and you know really thinking through the the context of the things that are made and the customer experience that people mm. have when they engage with their service. So I think it's it's ripe for you know more relationships and new ideas. Well, maybe. Uh... Maybe the design community uh, uh, needs to collaborate more itself before we can actually you know, bring this to public. You know, reaching out to the make industry, mm -hmm. more collaboration, like you said, with the engineers. Mm -hmm. And things like you know the Internet of Things community. Yeah. You know, I know people who definitely are uh, you know a bridge between that community and ours, and I think. Um, even the, the fact that we have siloed communities is, you know, that's natural and always going to exist. But I try really hard to join dots across the, all those communities as much as I can. Building bridges across design communities is, I think, uh, a skill we also uh, need very much at this mm -hmm. this phase. Uh, Lauren, um, you already touched upon uh, this topic, and uh, let's just dig in uh, a bit more. And uh, touch upon the third topic, and that's about proof. And I guess this is the proof of the value service design delivers. So do we have a question mm -hmm. started that goes along with that one? Mm -hmm. One that, that you haven't used yet? How can we? How can we? Yeah. How can we what? I think how can we um, get better at articulating our value? How can we do more things that become mainstream and have uh, you know have a very measurable impact and how can we get better at convincing um, convincing other disciplines why this process is Im is important and what value it adds um, and that's you know everything from proving that the proven that it creates very solid business opportunities from a commercial sense, proven that it can help create social change and that, you know, the number of people it reaches and in what way those people are are touched and how their lives change. Um, what, what kind of proof are you thinking uh, of in this case? So what kind of proof would we, what would we need? So I think, again, it comes back to the c collaboration, like working closely with people who are experts in measuring impact and evaluation. Um, that's, I think, a responsibility of our academic community as well, is to really raise the bar on that. Because I you know, go to lots of coffees, conversations, conferences. There's lots of great people doing this work, but mm -hmm. um, it still feels fluffy in lots of places um, and I think that's not because we're not trying um, but I think we can't settle you know it's how, looking at things like you know Spotify um, and the just the actual scale of that mm -hmm. product mm -hmm. um, you know I I would love to see things like that coming out of of this process in our community so uh, not stopping at the moment we've designed something, but uh, actually articulating what the impact, what the actual impact is of what we've designed and delivered. Yeah, and also being open to um, that show the process that we use as well. So how can we, how can we work with you know psychologists and. Um, behavioural economic experts to understand what a prototyping process is and how mm. that's different from a process where there's no prototyping and what difference does that make and how does it make people feel and what what difference does it make, you know, three, five, ten years down the line? I, I think uh, we don't want to get uh, into a world where designers fill in Excel sheets and uh, 
and make uh, make graphs and, and charts. So, what do you think is needed, or where can we get inspiration to to articulate our impact without getting into those well, uh, very statistical and analytical things? Mm. Well, I think that's our that's our design challenge. Is um, we need to. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but I would. I also think that you know, numerical data is is what it is and shouldn't mm -hmm. be avoided. And it reminds mm -hmm. me of how you know I meet a lot of students who talk about um, not wanting to write and hate. You know, they hate writing. They're terrible at writing. It's to be avoided at all costs. And I think we are guilty of doing that with. Um, mm -hmm numbers and data sometimes too and I think to be taken seriously in the world we we need to embrace both because there's there's no getting away from them mm -hmm. and again I, I, coming back to the first topic I think design education should and must play a big role in there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think it's not about becoming experts in all these things but it's about working closely with people knowing where to get that yeah, yeah. and yeah. really learning from other fields learning yeah. how other disciplines do yeah. this stuff cool lauren um there's also a, a question that you probably as a, uh, a teacher got asked a lot by people who want to get into service design aspiring service designer what would be your golden tip for them? What is the tip you give people that come to you and say, I want to get into service design? It's to design a service. <laughs> Just go out there and do it. Um, and that could be everything from spending the afternoon in your local coffee shop and then redesigning that service to working with a local business to working with an imaginary service. You just have to do it, use the tools, practice the methodology, try stuff out and show your work, show your process, invite others into that. And just, yeah, don't wait for opportunities to come to you because you have to go out there and, and find them. And I think the this is a very experiential process that you, you learn it by doing it. And if you would have to pick uh, a service to redesign first as a starting service designer, where where are the uh, clues? What kind of service would you redesign? I would tell them to redesign the service that makes them most angry. Hmm. So the service that has caused pain to somebody that they love, has made them lose lots of money, has made them lose, lose time, Something that really gets them like, this is not good enough, it needs to be fixed. I would start there. Redesign a service that get, makes you angry. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Lauren, this is also your opportunity to ask a question to the people who are actually viewing this episode. Is there a question you would have for them? Um, yeah, I would ask them... How can we, so at the next um, service design meetup conference, if we all have to bring somebody from a very uh, different field, so I bring a journalist, you bring a scientist, and Mark Stickdorn brings a musician, uh, how, can we, how can we do that? How can we talk to people who are different from us more and talk less to each other? So who would you bring to uh, to a next service design meetup? Yeah. Who should we bring? Who should we? Who isn't in the community already that we should invite? Mm-hmm. Uh, awesome, Lauren. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your having given us the opportunity to tap into the things you are thinking about. You're very welcome. Uh, lots of luck in London. Hope you do uh, thank great, you. great things there and. Uh, pushing it uh, pushing the service design field and challenging design education thank you very much i'll try my best what are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with lauren also if you have any suggestions on who we should invite next to the show be sure to let us know down below in the comments with the service design show we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people who are actually shaping the service design field if you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with service design pioneers 
subscribe to our channel and be sure to check out some of the past episodes. For now, thanks for watching.